Welcome to the forum, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The forum is a collaboration between the Harvard Chan School and independent news media. Each program features a panel of experts addressing some of today's most pressing public health issues. The forum is one way the school advances the frontiers of public health and makes scientific insights accessible to policymakers and the public. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. My name is Michelle Gershberg, and I am the U.S. Health Editor for Reuters. I'm also today's moderator. Our panelists, starting from my immediate right, are Howard Koh, Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership at the Harvard Chan School and the Harvard Kennedy School, Joseph Allen, Assistant Professor of Exposure Assessment Science at the Harvard Chan School, Vaughn Rees, Director of the Center for Global Tobacco Control at the Harvard Chan School, and joining us remotely, Karen Hacker, Director of CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. The event is being presented jointly with Reuters and is part of the Dr. Lawrence H. and Roberta Cohn Forum Series. We are pleased to welcome Mrs. Cohn today. We are streaming live on the websites of the Forum and Reuters, as well as on Reuters TV. We are also streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. This program will include a brief Q&A, and you can email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. So today we're here to talk about vaping, a complex public health issue that is the subject of hot debate between its critics and supporters. More recently, the practice has attracted national attention and new regulation in light of the rapid uptake of vaping products among American youth. In fact, this is the third forum on e-cigarettes. Today, we're gonna to look at a number of facets of the vaping debate, including the skyrocketing youth vaping rates that we're seeing, the emergence of vaping-related lung injury and illness, the evidence that we have so far for vaping as a tool to help people quit smoking, the state of regulatory policies to keep up with a fast-moving market, and more. Last week, one of those new policies went into effect. It was a nationwide ban on some types of e-cigarettes. Let's watch a clip from last month when the ban was first announced. The clip is courtesy of Reuters. In an effort to combat the rapid growth of vaping among teens, the Trump administration on Thursday announced the ban on popular e-cigarette flavors, including fruit and mint but said the sale of menthol and tobacco flavors will be allowed to continue. The Food and Drug Administration is giving companies 30 days to stop making and selling the banned flavors, which are often found in convenience stores. The new ban will likely be a blow to companies like Enjoy, which offers flavors such as watermelon and blueberry. But it won't impact vaping industry leader Juul, which stopped selling fruity flavors in October after coming under intense scrutiny over the safety of vaping. U.S. health regulators have been investigating a mysterious respiratory illness tied to vaping that has caused 55 deaths and more than 2,500 hospitalizations, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I think those numbers now are, are even higher, actually. Um, so, Howard, you have been a leader in tobacco control for much of your career. Can you give us some perspective on the current vaping debate within the larger picture of tobacco control? Well, thank you, Michelle. And it's great to join my esteemed colleagues on this very important panel. So this is a tremendously complicated and fast-moving area, so it's important at times like this to take a step back and try to get a perspective on the status of tobacco regulation and vaping in particular. So just to remind everybody, it was only in 2009 that the FDA was granted authority to, to regulate tobacco for the first time, a really historic development because tobacco remains a leading cause of preventable death worldwide and still kills nearly half a million Americans a year. The, the focus initially was on combustible 
products like cigarettes because non-combustible products like e-cigarettes were not even on the horizon back then. And very importantly, in 2009, flavored cigarettes were banned with the key exemption of menthol cigarettes. And we're going to be getting back to that, I'm sure, repeatedly through this webcast. So what's happened since then? E-cigarettes have come onto the market. Lots of interest about what its impact will be on public health. Many hope that it could be a form of harm reduction for smokers. But unfortunately, as Michelle has mentioned, uh, we have seen very disturbing rises of use in youth. Uh, recent studies show that more than one in four high schoolers use e-cigarettes, and this translates into some five million middle school and high school students. Flavored e-cigarettes have fueled a lot of that rise. And then, of course, Juul, based in San Francisco, uh, started promoting its products, uh, which are sleek and technology-based and feature these cartridges or pods, and that's gotten tremendous attention across the country. Uh, this rise has really concerned parents and families and health officials, and we can talk about the health effects today and going forward, but there's tr tremendous concern that yet another generation of kids are getting hooked on nicotine. And then, as was mentioned uh, last summer, Evali, e-cigarette or vaping-associated lung injury, emerged nationwide, and we're going to be hearing much more about that from our colleagues as well. So in the midst of all this, what's been the status of regulation? Uh, the FDA gained authority to regulate non-combustible products like e-cigarettes for the first time in 2016, but chose to exercise what they call enforcement discretion. So these products are on the market, although they're not uh, formally approved. In 2017, the FDA announced with great fanfare a proposed nicotine-based regulatory framework that could include e-cigarettes in addition to uh, standard nicotine uh, replacement therapy and also potentially uh, cigarettes with mandated low levels of nicotine below addictive levels. So that sparked a lot of interest, but that was proposed by former Commissioner uh, Scott Gottlieb, who has since departed. And then last fall, in the midst of Evaldi, President Trump announced his intention to ban all flavored e-cigarettes. But when the formal restrictions came out last week, as Michelle mentioned, uh, this was just a partial ban on flavors in e-cigarettes. And the great concern here is that with a partial ban, it will be very difficult to enforce and won't reverse the uh, youth epidemic as we know it. In the midst of all this, states have stepped up, like Massachusetts. Just a couple months ago, the Massachusetts governor announced uh, a ban on all flavored tobacco products, not just flavored e-cigarettes, but also menthol cigarettes. So that is getting lots of national attention. And so as 2020 moves on, this is going to be a very eventful year. May 12th, the FDA is requiring all e-cigarette manufacturers to file applications by that date proving or demonstrating public health benefit as a condition for staying on the market. So we're going to wait to see how all that proceeds. And then just a couple days ago, the Trump administration announced that they would favor moving regulatory authority over tobacco out of FDA into its own independent agency. So that's where we are right now. That's quite a 11-year period, and uh, we have to watch this very, very carefully as we move forward. Thank you. Joe, you have been studying some of these vaping-related illnesses, um, but you have also gotten into the e-cigarette research uh, in a very interesting way. Can you tell us your story? Yeah, happy to. So thanks, Michelle, and I share uh, Howard's um, view. I want to say thanks. It's great to be a part of this forum. So I, I consider myself an accidental e-cig researcher. I direct the Healthy Buildings Program here at Harvard. Uh, I've spent a career before Harvard doing forensic investigations of sick buildings, and it's actually a hidden connection between healthy buildings and the e-cig uh, issue we're facing. So I'll tell you the story quickly. A couple of years ago, I'm reading the New York Times, and I see an article that says there are 7,000 flavors on the market of e-cigs. And I had known from our work looking at workers in buildings and health that for over for 20 years now, we've known about the hazards of inhaling flavoring chemicals. 
This goes back to workers in a microwave popcorn manufacturing plant in early 2000. A physician noticed that eight people had severe decrements in lung function. They did an investigation of this facility and they noticed that workers in the mixing area in particular had developed, several of them developed severe and irreversible lung disease known as bronchiolitis obliterans. They started doing air sampling. They linked the causative agent to a flavoring chemical called diacetyl. Now these workers were working over vats. The flavoring chemical, this fake butter flavor, was mixed with the kernels. They were inha inhaling these heated flavoring chemicals. And many unfortunately developed this severe disease. So I go back to this, uh, more recently reading this New York Times article, I thought for sure someone had made this connection because we've known about this issue of inhaling flavoring chemicals for over 20 years. And, and there was nothing done or no research study produced. So we did what I think is the world's simplest study. We looked at emissions of e-cigarettes and to look for these flavoring chemicals. And sure enough, we found that in over 90% of the e-cigs we tested, we find these same flavoring chemicals that we know cause severe disease in workers who are inhaling them. These flavoring chemicals have a designation called GRAS, G-R-A-S, generally regarded as safe. That is for the ingestion pathway. They're not tested or approved for inhalation safety. And I and in our study where we find these flavoring chemicals, you know, diacetyl, people think, well, maybe it's just the butter flavor. No, diacetyl is a lot of uses. It creates a lot of different flavors. In fact, we saw diacetyl in e-cig flavors like apple, cherry, peach, grape, other uh, uh, tutti frutti and other uh, uh, flavors that are clearly, in my opinion, are, are marketed towards kids, and menthol and tobacco flavored, and that's relevant to the discussion on current policies and flavoring bans. But I think what much, most strikes me is that workers have been getting warnings about the dangers of inhaling these flavoring chemicals for a long time. This is the industry recommended warning, verbatim, warn, warning. This flavor may pose an inhalation hazard if improperly handled. The handling of this flavor that results in the inhalation of fumes, especially if the flavor is heated, may cause severe adverse health effects. We don't see those kind of warnings on e-cigarette packages despite the same pathway. You heat a flavoring chemical and inhale it. Second, if I'm an, a flavoring manufacturer and I create a, some interesting flavor and you're gonna sell this package up an e-cigarette or some manufactured food, when I send you my flavor, I have to send a safety data sheet that alerts you to the potential hazards and what protections you should have put in place for your workers who are mixing these. This includes hazard communication, this includes personal protective equipment like powered air purifying respirators. I've done investigations in other industrial facilities where workers have full face respirators on like a firefighter would, would wear, similar to that. Uh, there's medical screening and surveillance. And it just strikes me as wholly inconsistent that we've known about this for 20 years. Workers have been getting these warnings for 10 years and we don't give the same warnings to users of e-cigarettes. So it, it's, it seems impossible that someone can make an informed choice without knowing what they're inhaling. That's the, uh, quite an image, the, 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 the respirators. Um, Karen, we're going to go to you. Uh, can you tell us about the CDC's role in studying the health, the health impact of vaping and how you and your colleagues are working to minimize some of the harmful impacts that we're talking about here? Sure. I'm going to start out by talking about what we're considering to be two very different epidemics. Uh, we're going to talk about Avali, which is the situation that we've recently had, which is the epidemic and the new phenomena, but really started in 2019 and then peaked in, in September of 2019. And good news, this is declining ever since then. And then I'm also going to talk about what's going on with youth in terms of um, their use. So back to the Avali, um, as of February 4th, 2020, there was a total of 2,000 758 hospitalized Avali cases or deaths that had been reported to us at the CDC from all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and two U.S. territories. There were 64 deaths that had been confirmed in 28 states and the District of Columbia. By and large, the Avali epidemic was affecting young adults. The median age was 24, although we did see a range of 13 to 85 years. National and state data from patient reports and product sampling testing suggested that THC containing e-cigarettes or vaping products, particularly those from informal sources like friends, family, in-person or online dealers, were linked to most of the Avali cases. Um, in particular, as you probably know, vitamin E acetate was strongly linked to this Avali outbreak. 
However, it's important to know that the evidence is not sufficient to rule out the contribution of other chemicals, um, including chemicals either in THC or in non-THC products. Our latest guidance, uh, which I'll repeat here, is that CDC and FDA recommend that people not use THC-containing e-cigarette or vaping products, particularly from informal sources, as I've mentioned, such as friends, families, or online or in-person dealers. In addition, we want to constantly repeat the fact that e-cigarettes or vaping products should not ever be used by youth, young adults, or women who are pregnant. There's no redeeming way that that could be identified as something we would want. Now, as I previously mentioned, the youth e-cigarette epidemic is quite distinct from the Avali situation that we found, and it is equally concerning. The youth e-cigarette epidemic primarily is affecting adolescents. It's being driven by the use of nicotine-containing products, obtained mostly from formal sources in this case, and it's been caused by a variety of factors, some of which have already been mentioned, including advertising, attractive flavors like fruit and candy, and the availability of easily concealable devices that deliver very, very high levels of nicotine. You know, the, the pods that Howard talked about could be easily hidden in your pocket, in your coat, and they could be used um, very discreetly even within classrooms or at home. Youth e-cigarette or vaping products at this point has been on the rise since 2020, excuse me, since 2012. And we had the unprecedented spikes that we saw between 2017 and 2019. And as mentioned earlier, means that there are over 5 million youth that are currently using e-cigarettes. Put that in perspective, 30% of high school students and about 10% of middle school students are currently using e-cigarettes. So obviously this is a great concern to us. We know that nicotine harms the developing brain and it's particularly concerning during the adolescent years. We also know that the nicotine salts that have been found in some of the products, particularly such as Juul, is much stronger than the historically free-based nicotine that was found in combustible cigarettes. So now we have young people who are not only addicted to nicotine, but they're addicted to much higher levels of nicotine than even found in combustible cigarettes. And as you probably know, we do not currently have an FDA-approved nicotine cessation product for young people. Our strategies have got to be similar to what we've used for tobacco, and we know it works. We know that making it less accessible, less appealing is critically important. We know that adopting comprehensive smoke-free laws that also prohibit e-cigarette use are very important. We've got to restrict advertising and, and promotion. But we've also got to recognize that there's a whole change in novel strategies related to technology and how young people get information and how they learn about these types of products. And we can pretty much guarantee that there will be something else on the market tomorrow. So we know that there's a lot more work to do, and uh, we'll talk more about it as the panel goes on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so Vaughn, just to turn to you for the other side of the debate, right? We've talked about the dangers to youth, but part of what makes this issue so complex is that there is still um, reason to think of e-cigarettes as potentially a safer alternative to conventional smoking, conventional tobacco products. Uh, can you talk about what do we know about e-cigarettes in this context um, for smokers, uh, and are the new regulations or the attempts to regulate uh, leaving this community behind? Um, thank you. I think I think that's a very good question, and um, and Howard uh, certainly helped us set the stage here in terms of helping us to think about the background to uh, to tobacco control. I think it is important as you know as we are considering issues and questions around vaping and regulation of vaping devices that we. Uh, that we recognise that tobacco, that is combusted cigarettes, are the real killer. We, we you know, the, the death rate in the United States is is running currently at somewhere between 1,200 and 1,300 people per day. These are premature, preventable deaths that are attributable to smoking. Um, we're at low historic rates in terms of the overall prevalence of smoking in the adult population in the United States. 
Um, as Karen pointed out, we've, we've got a lot of evidence-based strategies that we know work over, over several decades. We've seen, uh, we've seen that the, the rates of smoking in the United States uh, move down to somewhere around 14%, which is, which is outstanding, and, uh, and the United States is, is a world leader in, in that respect. Um, nonetheless, we, we continue to see vast disparities in smoking. Um, these, these, the successes that we've seen in tobacco control have not necessarily been experienced uh, by all members of our, of our, uh, of our communities. Um, and in particular, we still see very high rates of smoking among people of very low income background, uh, the socioeconomically disadvantaged, and other groups that we would traditionally regard as being vulnerable, that is, uh, people who have mental illness, people with substance use problems, um, people from the LGBTQ community um, continue to smoke at rates that are vastly higher, twice or three times, the rate of the general population. Um, we know that quitting smoking is hard, and, uh, and even with the best evidence-based interventions available, um, somewhere fewer than 10% of people who make a, a quit attempt uh, are still able to achieve abstinence at the end of one year. Uh, what this is telling me is that we need opportunities, we need to provide alternatives to adult smokers to reduce their risk of, uh, of, of, of illness and premature death um, and to, uh, to, to think creatively about innovative strategies um, of which vaping devices uh, happens to be one. Um, the opportunity to deliver clean nicotine to adult smokers in a way that can support them transitioning away from the very, the vastly more harmful exposure to uh, combusted tobacco smoke is, is something that we continue to need to think about very carefully. The challenge of course is, and I absolutely agree with, with all of my colleagues here, with Joe, with Karen and with Howard, is we need to keep these devices out of the hands of kids. Um, compared with not vaping or not smoking, any level of vaping, of course, in adolescence, particularly in adolescence, um, is, is, is potentially risky. Um, and so we need, we need to continu continue to, uh, to strive to implement strategies that, uh, that, that keep vaping devices out of the hands of kids, but we need to do it in a way that doesn't disenfranchise adult smokers um, so that we can continue to, uh, to drive down smoking rates and prevent the vast number of premature preventable deaths that smoking causes in the United States each year. So how do we do this? It does require many of the strategies that we've touched on today. We need proper regulation of these devices. Um, vaping devices need to be cleaned up. Uh, the FDA is looking very carefully at strategies by which they will regulate uh, vaping devices. Um, and, uh, and I expect that product standards will be introduced in the future as we understand the way in which these products function and the sorts of uh, constituents that, are being, uh, that, 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 that they are exposing uh, consumers to. We also need to communicate the risks very clearly. And, uh, and I think m much of the recent um, communication has highlighted um, risks that adult smokers are not necessarily exposed to. Evali, for example, or the risks of uh, flavor-based compounds are vastly lower than the risk for adult smokers of continuing to smoke. And we need to help adult smokers to understand um, uh, that, that vaping devices may indeed still offer a viable alternative and a preferable al alternative over smoking. Thank you. Um, so we are now going to take a more detailed look at some of the issues that um, our panelists have raised. To get us started, uh, we're going to watch another clip. Uh, this is a clip uh, in which a young man describes his own experience with the Juul e-cigarette. This clip is also shown courtesy of Reuters. I couldn't focus on my schoolwork at all because all I was focusing on was just trying to get more nicotine and I've, I, my grades actually fell pretty far behind because I just wasn't focused at all. I was just focused on getting another hit of the vape. 17-year-old William Smith says he became addicted to vaping. Juul, his brand of choice. He started when he was 15, and at his peak, Smith says he was using one flavored Juul pot or more every day, inhaling the same amount of nicotine found in a pack of 20 cigarettes. Yeah, no one thought it was bad. No one knew what it did. So at the time, yeah, everyone thought it was just like a good thing that made people happy and less stressed. 
It's really not wonderful. The Trump administration in September announced plans to ban all flavored e-cigarette products, which have been criticized for appealing to teens, following a U.S. Food and Drug Administration warning that Juul was misleading consumers by marketing its products as safer than cigarettes. Juul responded by halting U.S. sales of its flavored pods, except for mint, menthol, and tobacco flavors. But when Smith was vaping, the fruity and sweet flavors were popular. People would like just randomly ask me in the middle of class if I could, if they could use my thing just out of nowhere. Could it, Just throughout the entire day, people were just asking if they could use it and use it and use it. And that just continued on because everyone was like addicted. It was yeah. bad. Juul is under fire from critics who say it helped create an epidemic of teenage nicotine use. So no one thought it was bad and everyone is addicted. This is what we, we, we heard from William. Um, and it suggests to us that um, people, what, including many youth, may not realize how addictive these vaping products can be uh, until it's too late for them. Can we talk about the new U.S. ban that's been put into effect? Um, do we think that it's going to help prevent additional teen use? And what do we do about young people like William who've already become addicted? Once it, Howard, would you like to? So as I mentioned earlier, the, the hope was that the flavored e-cigarette ban would, would be a complete uh, ban and, and really be easily understood and easily implemented. But the fact that the FDA has announced this partial ban last week creates a very complicated landscape right now. So for example, menthol is still exempted from that ban. Uh, other products like disposable e-cigarettes are exempted from that ban. And so it creates a, a, a very, very complex uh, arena. And um, it's, it's gonna be ch very challenging, I think, for the FDA to, to uh, do this in a, in a comprehensive and effective way that reverses the youth epidemic that we're all so concerned about. Uh, let, let me give you one example of uh, some of the debate. With menthol being exempted, some would argue uh, leave menthol alone in e-cigarettes because menthol cigarettes are still on the market, and if you ban menthol on e-cigarettes, it'll just push people who are vaping back to a more harmful product. But a response to that would be to eliminate menthol in, in cigarettes as well and just take all those flavors off the market. And that's what's been announced by the Massachusetts governor here, a ban on all flavored tobacco products, cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And so we're going to watch that carefully. We have some colleagues in the audience who will be evaluating that ban here in the state as we move forward. And we also are looking to see what other states are going to do as this, this federal ban uh, goes, in, a partial ban goes into place. Vaughn, do you want to talk about what we know about nicotine and, and youth addiction? Sure. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a very great problem, and, and the recent uptick in, in youth vaping is, is uh, particularly alarming. Uh, we know that nicotine dependence uh, can have uh, profound effects on uh, young people's development, on the, on the developing brain. Um, it does increase the risk for the, uh, dependence or, or use of uh, other nicotine products in the future, as well as engaging in other types of uh, substance uh, use. We know that uh, the, the, the experience of nicotine withdrawal, which, is a, which accompanies nicotine dependence, can undermine uh, a lot of uh, uh, routine tasks, including uh, educational uh, responsibilities or obligations, uh, social activities, um, restricting or restraining kids' uh, behavioural repertoire and, uh, and causing you know, uh, uh, long-term uh, impacts on, on their, their overall uh, development. Um, treatment options for young people, for adolescents, is somewhat limited. Um, and, and there's no question that this is a profound problem. I, I would add this though, the, the rates of youth that vape on a daily basis are quite similar to the rates of young people who smoke. So I think that we shouldn't uh, perhaps uh, overestimate or, or overemphasize uh, the risks of vaping among youth compared with smoking, and we shouldn't lose sight of, uh, of interventions that, are con that continue to be required to help to prevent youth smoking. Um, the sorts of strategies that have been very effective in reducing youth smoking, also to historic rates, should be and can be applied to vaping products. Restrictions of flavours have already been applied to tobacco products. 
Uh, there was a time in, in recent years when uh, candy flavoured, exotic flavours, fruit flavours, alcohol flavoured cigarettes were available for young people. Those are now banned by the FDA. Um, we can apply similar bans to the vast range of, uh, of flavoured vaping products to help to make them less appealing to youth. Um, a recent ban by uh, the federal government has increased the age of sale of all tobacco products, which includes vaping products, from 18 to 21. And that will have, uh, that will have profound impact in reducing demand and access among young people, both for cigarettes and for vaping products. So we're working, I think, with the federal and state regula regulatory authorities are working very well towards um, imposing or implementing strategies that will continue to arrest uh, the, the rates of use, use of both vaping products and uh, combusted tobacco products. Um, but again, I come back to the need for providing clean nicotine for adult smokers to help them reduce their risk of, uh, of uh, smoking related illness. You raise um, several important points and one I wanted to bring to, to Karen. Um, we sometimes talk about the youth vaping epidemic in a vacuum as if it's separate from youth, um, the attraction to smoking. And how do you understand those two trends working together? Um, and, and also what is CDC, how is, what is CDC's approach to, um, to advising, you know, uh, on a public health level, you know, how to help youngsters quit when, as you've said, there's no real approved product to do that. So I'll start with what are we doing to monitor this uh, scenario, which is obviously very fast changing. So everybody may be aware that, you know, we've had this annual survey called the National Youth Tobacco Survey, which has been a collaboration with the uh, FDA, and that's really been the gold standard. But the challenge, of course, is that that's a once a year survey, and that hasn't really been able to identify new and emerging trends. So we are really getting much more involved in considering sales data, in looking at social media, using web panel surveys to complement our efforts in order to determine whether there are new products that are coming online, uh, whether or not there's a shift, very fast shifting change in the use of certain products as well. Um, in addition, we're very interested in trying to understand what these regulations that have now been put forth, what the impact of those are. One thing that people may have already heard of, for example, that I haven't heard mentioned yet, is the puff bars or the single use uh, um, e-cigarettes that apparently also can continue to have flavors. And we have heard stories from people in the educational system in particular telling us that young people are going after those those are currently not included in the current regulation. Um, I do also want to mention that the vape shops have been are excluded from the regulation, and we have no way of being able to monitor those at this point in time. Um, the last thing I'm going to just say in terms of what's available for, for uh, prevention, um, as I mentioned, there's, there's all the things that we've been doing with regard to tobacco. I think the challenge right now, and, and um, as an adolescent medicine physician on top of it, is what can we offer young people who are currently addicted to nicotine? Um, as you know, there is no cessation products that have been FDA approved for this population. We do know that there's off-label uh, prescribing that's taking place. Um, and obviously that is happening between the physician and the young person. There are a number of organizations that are working on mobile devices to provide curricula, et cetera, et cetera, to help young people get off of the nicotine that they're now on. As I mentioned earlier, these extremely high levels of nicotine that they were getting through the products, as mentioned earlier. So um, to, to go back to the, the high nicotine and, and also with the, the the, what the product is. I mean, maybe Joe, you can, this is a place you want to talk about, you know, what we're seeing, what are these ingredients? Do we have real regulation that's beginning to address that piece of it? You know, what what is this item, right? Yeah, well, I think that's been a lot of the problem here. And, uh, you know, I'm glad we're having the discussion about relative and absolute risk is that, um, you know, we always think, well, they're safer than these things are safer than cigarettes, but everything's safer than a cigarette. And so it gets the discussion of absolute versus relative. And I think we've been given this message for a long time now, maybe to youth, that maybe safer equals safe. And that gets to this question of what are we really disclosing or what do we understand about what's in the product? And I'll give you an example for some leading products that are out there. The ingredient label has five seemingly simple ingredients. One of those is just flavors. 
All right, so I earlier talked about the issues of inhaling flavoring chemicals. There was a study published last year that found over a dozen what these authors call harmful or irritating flavoring chemicals in some of these leading e-cig manufacturing products. So that word flavor is doing a lot of work. The uh, Industry Flavoring Association to protect the respiratory health of workers has identified 27 high priority flavoring chemicals that they know injure the lungs. And so workers, again, are protected from this. Again, that's all hinted under flavors. But I wanna talk about something that no one is really talking about. We've been talking about flavorings for a couple of years now. There's a second ingredient on there called propylene glycol. Propylene glycol is the carrier fluid. Constitute the vast majority of the e-liquid. When you heat propylene glycol, you can generate formaldehyde. Our study a couple of years ago showed this. Many others have seen this now. Formaldehyde, of course, is a carcinogen, causes wheezing, uh, burning sensation in the throat and nose. And we found formaldehyde at levels that exceed what we call a ceiling limit for workers. A ceiling limit is a level that workers are not allowed to be exposed to even for one second. There's something else with propylene glycol that no one is talking about yet, and I'm glad we have this forum to share it. In that paper, we looked at secondary formation of toxics from propylene glycol, and we showed, theoretically, you could generate a chemical called methyl glyoxal. It turns out a paper a couple uh, months ago by these same researchers who first discovered popcorn lung, now eight, 20 years ago, showed that methyl glyoxal is more toxic than diacetyl, the chemical associated with popcorn lung. And they're chemical cousins. These, they are related. They are alpha dicarbonyls. So related chemical. And these authors were surprised. They tested the toxicity of diacetyl and the te uh, toxicity of methyl glyoxal. Methyl glyoxal is being produced in our testing, 100% of e-cigarettes we've tested generate methyl glyoxal. Others have seen this too. In fact, there's a really interesting study that looked at the saliva of vapors before and after they vaped. And they find methyl glyoxal after they've vaped. So we have this whole connection here with this uh, propylene glycol on the label, what, what's behind that. And we see mechanistically it makes sense, theoretically. We've measured it in emissions of e-cigarettes. Others have seen this actually in the body of vapors. And it's not really talked about because the ingredient label gives this maybe, um, well, certainly it's an incomplete description of what's coming out of these uh, e-cigarettes. And so how can, like I said in my first answer, how can anyone really make these decisions about what's okay or if I'm thinking about different smoking cessation approaches? Uh, and I look at this label and kids probably do this too. I say, well, flavors and these other, uh, you know, only five ingredients, well, maybe that's not all that bad. And meanwhile, the science is telling us something uh, quite different. Um, I think Joe is making very good points. Exposure of any of these constituents in young people who don't, uh, who don't use other substances is extremely problematic. What, what we also should point out is that most, if not all, of the constituents Joe uh, pointed to exist in the emissions of combusted tobacco cigarettes in some cases in orders of magnitude greater than, than are seen in, in, uh, in vaping devices. Um, so again, although, although there is no safe level of exposure, the, uh, the, uh, the, the point is that smokers can reduce their risk of exposure to these constituents by moving to a, uh, a less harmful form of uh, nicotine delivery. And, and, and I think that is part of our, our challenge is communicating uh, to the right constituency to youth uh, not to use these products at all but to smokers that there may be some relative advantage in, uh, in, in uh, discontinuing smoking and, and using a product that lowers their overall exposure to these otherwise very harmful constituents. So Vaughn, you've, you've also talked about helping using these products as a way of helping people transition right away. Um, are, are the policies that we have in place, are they, do, do you think that they're helping guide industry towards developing products and innovative products that will really help somebody move not just off of tobacco, um, but also eventually off of nicotine addiction? Is, uh, is, is there a transition product that's, that, that we're, you know, environment that we're fostering? Well, um, ironically, some of the big vaping device manufacturers have uh, have made uh, have suggested that they may be able to achieve that, but in reality, they've uh, instead chosen to market their products to young people. So we haven't seen that 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 promise delivered. Um, but uh, and I think the current regulatory environment makes it very challenging for uh, for the manufacturers of vaping devices to uh, to develop products 
um, uh, that, that that may succeed in in that mission. But I'm I'm optimistic that uh, that it, as we move forward, uh, federal regulators will find ways to identify. Um, uh, mechanisms to uh, understand how um, vaping devices may support smokers in uh, in in permanently quitting smoking and, and moving to a less harmful device. Um, manufacturers uh, of vaping devices will be submitting pre-market applications to the FDA to demonstrate how and why their products are in the interest of the public health and that may be informative in terms of helping us understand how they may uh, support um, reduction in risk for adult smokers. Howard, is this is this a particularly tough market to regulate? It's a tough market because, uh, as I mentioned, because of the decision in 2016 to exercise enforcement discretion, these products are on the market and causing now uh, these tremendous problems among youth uptake without regulation. And so that's why May 12th is very, very important. Getting these applications in from the manufacturers, having the FDA finally do formal uh, evaluation as a condition for these products to stay in the market, that's all very, very critical. Uh, I think also, and maybe I can get into this now, um, Michelle, with this federal activity going on, it's very important to keep our eye on the states and the cities. So I've mentioned Massachusetts now a couple times. But we have states like Michigan and New Jersey that have banned flavored e-cigarettes. Uh, we know that states like uh, Rhode Island and Montana and a number of others have also taken action. So for all those, all those activities, we need to follow what's happening, evaluate it, see if we have lessons learned that can inform other states and indeed the country at large. And then it's very important to note that in San Francisco itself, there was uh, announcement last year that they would ban all e-cigarettes in that city starting last month, January of this year. And that uh, led to opposition from Juul because Juul is based in San Francisco and it went to a ballot initiative and the people of San Francisco uh, voted overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly to maintain that, that ban. So it's a very, very complex. I think the evaluation and the science of all this is, is critically important and we need to track this going forward to see how it all relates back to hitting the bullseye of uh, ending smoking for the future. Thank you. Um, Karen, I, I'm wondering if you can share um, some new details about the CDC investigation into EVALI, the, the vaping-related illness. Um, and I did want to pick up on a point from Joe as well, which is, suggest which is um, you know, we have EVALI that has been associated with THC, illicit THC use, informal products or illicit products, but there are also suggestions, you know, are there, are there elements or chemicals within the more conventional uh, products on the marketplace that we need to be concerned about? So let me talk a little bit about what happened to give you a flavor for how we actually approach this problem, no pun intended there. Um, on August 1st, 2019, um, Wisconsin first alerted the CDC about a cluster of pulmonary injury among young adults, and that had begun in July of 2019. Uh, CDC implemented an incident command structure at that point, and then on September 16, 2019, we activated our emergency operations center, which allows us to bring in more dedicated staff and resources to help with the investigation. We pulled in scientific expertise from across our agency to focus on the epidemiologic, laboratory, and clinical realms. And we were working with many, many organizations across the country um, at the state level, at the national level, um, and letting the public know what was going on as we were able to understand it. Um, our response efforts mainly focused on identifying and defining first and foremost the risk factors and the sources for e-cigarettes and other vaping products that were used in lung injury. Um, as you may know, it is very challenging because, for example, we might get a web address. As soon as we got that web address, it was gone, literally. So identifying where these products came from was extremely challenging. Simultaneously, most of the individuals who were ill had used multiple products. There wasn't one flavor, there wasn't one particular product. They used both uh, things that they got off the web, THC, but then they also used some of the con more conventional products as well. 
Um, we were detecting and tracking confirmed and probable cases with the help of um, all of the states and localities that were involved. And we were communicating that information on a regular basis. And then the laboratory studies began as samples came in. And that was really what helped us identify that uh, the vitamin E acetate was particularly concerning to us. Um, all of that information was being put out regularly to the public. I think sometimes there's a frustration that things weren't happening fast enough, but we really needed to know that our evidence was strong while we released this information. And so our messaging to the public was for the vast majority of this time was to avoid using e-cigarettes because we did not know what chemical components were causing the problem. By the time uh, the Evali situation seemed to be dissipating, which is you know, literally within the last several months, we were pretty clear that vitamin E was at least one of the major culprits. But again, we're still saying that there may be other chemical additives. Um, and uh, the, the biggest concern we have at this point in time is that while vitamin E may disappear, there may be other additives that start to get included as well. And it becomes very difficult to know where that's happening. Are people pulling their own devices? Are they using um, informal devices? Are they using devices that they could purchase and that they can fill themselves in terms of the refill odds? All of those types of questions that come up. Thank you. Um, so we are now going to turn to our Q&A portion. Uh, we've been receiving questions um, online. Uh, and, and the first actually kind of piggybacks off what we were just discussing. This is from Jeffrey Drazen of the New England uh, <laughs> Journal of Medicine. Are there essentially two different illnesses? The recent one, likely, likely caused by contamination in so-called juice, uh, and a more insidious one with explosive, without explosive onset, but at a low frequency, and likely causing an irreversible lung disease? If so, the latter may be a bigger threat to our population. Joe, is well, yeah, I'd jump. I, I, I think I appreciate that perspective, um, and that's been my concern. There's been so much attention on e-cig and this uh, lung disease around vitamin E acetate, and rightfully. Uh, but it seems as the cases are dropping that we're ignoring these other, uh, this other scientific evidence that suggests uh, and without exaggeration, that, that millions of people are inhaling a, a, a cocktail of chemicals that we know cause injury to the lung. Um, and if you look at going back to, to workers, and it's not just popcorn workers, this is going on for decades now, and it's not just acid, it's a whole mix of flavoring chemicals, and many that don't appear in, uh, in cigarettes. Um, you find that, uh, that the, the workers, um, uh, or that the, the, um, the illnesses go beyond this, this uh, irreversible lung disease of bronchiolitis obliterans. In fact, many of these people have developed asthma uh, as a result of inhaling these flavoring chemicals, um, chronic bronchitis. So these are things that wouldn't be captured in the current surveillance system, but speaks to the, uh, to the comment here that there's this low level underlying chronic exposure that's occurring and there are other diseases that our current surveillance system are most definitely not capturing. Can I just add a thing, something to this? Yeah. You know, I think for us, there's no question that the Avali situation was a unique phenomenon, but it does uh, bring up this question of somehow a chronic, more underlying issue that may be going on for a much longer period of time and much more subtle to detect. We do know that there were a number of other chemicals that were identified. We talked, you know, there's heavy metals, there's other things that have been identified. And one of the biggest challenges is that the consumer generally does not know what they are inhaling because it is not labeled as such. Um, and it, as a result of that, it becomes very difficult. And then, as I said, the concern that there may be new additives that may be coming in to stretch whatever is being stretched and the consumer will not be aware of those either. So our, our next question comes from Susan Almy from the New Hampshire House of Representatives. Um, She's asking whether the federal system is biased against low-cost treatments provided by low-margin operators, such as shops run by ex-vapers who are trying to help others quit. Does this freeze out almost the, all of the research on the efficacy and relative safety of using vaping in open systems in a way that would reduce nicotine content gradually to zero and then help try to wean the user off of inhaling? Is anyone working on this? 
Well, there is uh, there is a considerable amount of research going on, uh, helping us to understand how different systems function, how they deliver nicotine to consumers, and the impact on on uh, on use behaviour, including dependence. Um, that research, though, I think it's important to point out, is not generated by these small uh, manufacturers. Um, the small manufacturers will face the difficulty of having to submit um, by, uh, by, by May of this year a uh, pre-market um, uh, application to continue to, to the FDA to continue to stay in the market. Um, my understanding is, or my expectation is, that most of them don't have the resources to demonstrate that their devices are in the interest of the public health. Um, so, uh, so whether or not they have uh, the, they have products that may be advantageous to uh, to adult smokers in reducing their risk, uh, we we may uh, we may not know. Independently of their innovations, there is some research going on, but it may not be sufficient for us to completely understand the, the full scope of the uh, the issue. Uh, can I also add to that? Um, I do want to point people to the most recent Surgeon General cessation report. It literally came out several weeks ago, and there is a, a very comprehensive assessment of the current knowledge of uh, the efficacy of e-cigarettes for cessation. And the bottom line is at this time, the evidence is not ample to be able to really say that these are cessation devices. So clearly there is more research that needs to be done. Thank you. Um, so we have a new question uh, from coming from Meredith. Has Professor Allen's research been presented to the Center for Tobacco Products at FDA? Mm -hmm. And if so, what kind of response have you received? Uh, not specifically there, but I'll tell you, uh, we presented it uh, just about everywhere. And um, I'm proud to say our paper is still the number one red paper in environmental health perspective for five years running. I think this, this knowledge is out there. It's not like this is a secret. Um, and in terms of the response, I will say the response has been quite interesting going, and this is a, a, a little bit of a switch of the topic, but um, as many researchers in this field and other fields get when you're, in, it's a controversial or a difficult topic, um, you know, there have been uh, pushback. There's been letters uh, to my dean about our work. There's been mm -hmm. uh, industry consultants uh, rebutting our work or trying to rebut our work anyway. Um, so this is the, the kind of, the, the, this is a heated topic. Uh, and so some of uh, our work is all out there and certainly has raised the attention of um, some manufacturers. So we're certain that, uh, that uh, it's reached a wide audience, yeah. Okay. Um, so here's a, a question from Dan Daniel Wickler, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, of Harvard Chan. Uh, critics of CDC uh, allege that nicotine addicts who had switched to e-cigarettes were driven back to smoking as a result of the various state responses to the temporary advice that no one should vape. Do you agree that that was a misstep, serious misstep on CDC's part? Did it occasion a review within CDC to understand how this happened to ensure that CDC's advice on vaping can be relied on in the future? I think it's very important that uh, everybody realize that from the perspective of the CDC, we do not want anyone to go back to smoking. We don't want people who never went to smoking, such as young people, to go to smoking combustible cigarettes. And we certainly don't want people who are using vaping as another means to go back to cigarettes. Um, at this point in time, I do not believe that we have evidence that in fact that is occurring. Um, although we are, as I mentioned earlier, looking at sales data and things like that. Probably know that at least for young people, smoking combustible cigarettes has been at an all time low. Um, I think the challenge is to remind ourselves that many people who are vaping are also smoking at the same time. Um, they're doing what we call dual use. And that has also made it very difficult to assess the value of uh, e-cigarettes in particular as a cessation device. So from our perspective, again, um, we do not want or we do not suggest, we do not in any way um, support the idea that individuals move from vaping back to combustible cigarettes. Okay, um, so I think we're gonna go into our, our wrap up mode right now. Perhaps um, we can have a couple of words from each of you on you know, what kind of takeaway solution or message you might um, give us in this debate. Uh, Vaughn, do you wanna start? Uh, sure. I, you know, I think uh, I think we've seen uh, important successes in tobacco control, driving down rates of smoking. However, 
those those successes have not been shared among all and uh, and finding ways to support um, discontinuation of smoking particularly among vulnerable populations is is a concern that I have um, finding ways to deliver clean nicotine through a properly regulated properly communicated in terms of the health risks uh, 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 innovative uh, device I think may be critical in helping to us to uh, helping us to achieve those outcomes but we want to do it in a way that does not uh, uh, increase interest demand for or use of these products among young people um, we have seen in some jurisdictions for example uh, in the United Kingdom a, 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 I think a more proportionate response in the way uh, vaping devices are regulated relative to combusted tobacco products and uh, and those sorts of lessons may be helpful in the United States as we think about ways to keep them out of the hands of kids, make them uh, as, as uh, low risk as possible and communicate the risks accurately to adult smokers to uh, help support them in reducing their risk of premature uh, death and disease. Sure. So uh, thanks for uh, having us at this forum, Michelle. So. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I learned a lot here too because that's the first time I've heard that uh, that these are not proven to be a smoking cessation tool. So I feel like I haven't had complete information. And while the other end of that, there is evidence these are smoker creation tools. And I think we're that's uh, really important to keep that in mind because that gets to my series of what I think are three uh, reasonable and prudent recommendations. <laughs> First is, is to, we have to always consider the absolute and relative um, hazards here, right? And that's even for smokers who are trying to quit so that they can assess which pathway is best for them. But we, we can't get there until we have full transparency and disclosure. And here we should require, we need to require manufacturers to disclose not just what's in the e-liquid, but what is being emitted because that is ultimately what's being inhaled. And when we do that, it goes way beyond a handful of ingredients. Uh, and the last thing I'd say is, uh, is, is maybe the most uh, disturbing thing to me here is the, is the knowledge and having seen this firsthand that the protections, the, the effort that we go to protect workers from inhaling these flavoring chemicals and giving warnings, and this is from the industry itself, that it seems reasonable at a minimum we should be giving those same work, uh, warnings to users of e-cigarettes who are following that same pathway of inhaling heated flavoring chemicals. Howard, So we have a very busy year ahead and everyone needs to follow this very, very carefully because there's so much at stake with respect to public health. But I think my overall comment is as there's more attention to regulating e-cigarettes at the federal, state, and local level, everybody should keep in mind how, how does this relate back to combustible tobacco products. My colleague Cliff Douglas and I have written that the key here is to remember that the bullseye, the bullseye is ending smoking. And if we keep that broad perspective, we know that our overall goals are to protect kids, re reverse this current epidemic for them, uh, keep them tobacco free and substance free, help smokers, help them to quit, and reduce harm as much as possible for them going forward, and then try to denormalize this epidemic that's robbed so many people of good health for, for far too long. Karen, will you uh, wrap us up? Sure. Now, we've heard a lot today, and I think uh, hopefully the audience has gotten a pretty good understanding of what some of the efforts have been and what's been going on. Uh, I think from the perspective of the CDC, we recognize that we must be more proactive in tracking any new tobacco products as they appear, understanding how they are affecting the population and in particular young populations um, so that we can mitigate the risks effectively. Um, we've got to be using new technology because that's how we communicate now with adolescents. And I think that the strategies that have been mentioned today in terms of um, what is available as FDA approved cessation, what could potentially be available for young people in particular, and uh, all of the comments with regard to how best to think through the contents of this incredibly varied market is going to be very important going forward. Thank you. So I, I would like to thank um, all of our panelists uh, and our audience, both in the studio uh, and online. Um, before we go, I'd just like to say that next week the forum will have a Facebook Live Q&A 
uh, about the new coronavirus outbreak um, on February 19th uh, on the forum Facebook page. That will be followed by a full forum on the virus on March 2nd, uh, and then uh, tune into the forum again on March 18th for a discussion about homelessness in America. Thank you very much.